Yeah. We are. We're ready whenever you are. Yeah. I just saw you on the hallway. Now I see you on the screen, I think. <laughs> um, look, at all good. Happy to be out there practicing. Um, I don't have much to say. I'm just going to open it up and let you fire away. It's good to see everybody. It's good to be doing one of these. So appreciate everybody being here. Let's go first to Adam Teicher. Go ahead, Adam. Hey, Steve. How are you doing today? Great, Adam. Good. Hey, um, we were talking last week to uh, Hitchens and to Tyron, and they were talking about the emphasis you're putting on uh, fixing the red zone defense, yeah. being better in the red zone. Are, are there some components that are really important to be a good red zone defensive team? Are there things you look at and say, if we do this well, we're going to we're going to play well down there? Uh, you mean like general ones, Adam, or, yeah. or what we did? Right? Yeah, just in general, playing good yeah. red zone defense. Yeah, I mean. I mean, the first thing to me is we always say is we we don't want to allow teams to run the ball. We really do want to force them to throw it um, and then have tight coverage. I mean, down there, the throwing lanes get tight. We all know that, everybody that knows football. So you try to force them into throwing it in those tight windows. So that's, that would be the first thing. Um, you know, in these kind of practices, we obviously don't get runs, so we can't really work on that. That'll come in training camp or in preseason games. But then the second thing is just everybody being on the same page. The third thing to me is, is where the league uh, football in general has gone in the red zone, especially in the tight red zone with all the, I'm going to call it option football. We call it swaps and seals and tight ends coming, coming across behind the line of scrimmage. There, there's a lot of challenging football nowadays and you got to make decisions on zone or man and how many guys you put up on the line. So we're working through all of that and hopeful uh, that we can get better. And, uh, I, you know, if we had just played, uh, I don't know, 50% better in the red zone last year, it made a huge difference and certainly points allowed. And, and I, I didn't think we were terrible, terrible in points allowed, but certainly when people got in the red zone, it was a challenge for us. Go next to Sam McDowell. Go ahead, Sam. Hey, Steve. Hey, Sam. Um, last week, Andy mentioned that he thought one of the, your under the radar signings this year was, uh, was Jaron Reed. I'm wondering what he allows you to do on the defensive line, specifically um, perhaps with, with moving Chris around a little bit. Yeah, I tell you what, Sam, we're, we're really trying to figure that out, uh, to be quite honest with you, and it's going to take a little bit of time. But listen, I remember when he was at Alabama, I have a good friend that um, actually trained him as he got ready for the combines. So we have a mutual friend, coach I have a lot of respect for. And I've always – liked him as a player. So I'm glad we got him. We've had him here a few days here. And I tell you, he, I texted him the other day. I just really like the way he handles himself here. Practice. He's serious about football. He knows when to lighten it up right now. In the short amount of time I've had with him, I really love the personality, the attitude and what he gives us as a football player. Let's go next to Herbie TLP. Go ahead, Herbie. Hey coach. Good seeing you as always. You too, Herbie. Hey, I have two questions for you. The first one, obviously, you're bringing Ken Vajoli in. What was your reaction to be reunited with him? I know he served with you as a defensive coordinator uh, yeah. in St. Louis. Yeah. Well, I tell you, Ken Flagel. Flagel. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we laugh about, you know what, Herb? I call him that just kidding around sometimes. So I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell him that you said that. I would tell him it was you. Uh, but he'll laugh. He'll laugh. He'll think it's funny. That's like nobody can pronounce my name either, right? I mean, you guys figured it out after a while. But listen, uh, Ken and I have known each other for a long time. Andy knew him way before I did, uh, but I got to know him the same time I got to know Andy when they were on the staff at UTEP together in Missouri. He's been in the league a long time. Like you said, he was a defensive coordinator for us in St. Louis. And I just got a great deal of respect for him. I think he's just going to be a, a great sounding board for me, another set of eyes, and somebody that's uh, had a lot of experience in this league. And, you know, on game day, I know Ken, we, we run – together on the sideline he's really good on game day with sorting things out run schemes and what the offense is trying to do to us so i'm looking forward to that and you know he knows matt and brendan a lot of these guys so it's been kind of pretty comfortable um him just coming here it's been great he's been great to have and the second part of the um, half of you coaches obviously you've got two young linebackers here in, in uh, willie gay as well as nick bolton what's your excitement mm -hmm. level as you've watched them and what kind of feedback are you getting from your friend. I'm not going to try to pass the name. Coach Flagel. <laughs> yeah. You call him Ken. We just go Ken. Uh, listen, Matt House does a great job with those guys. I really get my feedback from Matt on the linebackers, and he do, he's been doing a terrific job. But both those guys were, were really excited to have uh, and really looking forward to what they can do. I mean, let's not forget Willie Gay didn't have any preseason games last year. 
Um, now Nick will get a benefit of that this year. Uh, we'll, we're going to try to find ways to get him on the field. It might take a little while. Um, you know, the volume of defense is probably catching up with the both of them right now. You know, we've asked uh, Willie to play two different spots, Sam and Will. That's typical in the NFL, just like we do with really all our linebacks, except for, uh, except for Hitch. Uh, but we're glad we got them both. We're looking forward to what they can do. We'll go last two, Pete and then Sarin. Go to Pete. Hey, Steve. Good to see you again. Um, you too, Pete. So last year we saw, you know, no Breland at the beginning of the year because of the suspension, obviously not here anymore. Uh, how much of a desire is there to push Legarius to the outside? And, and if so, in that, what happens in, in that slot position that he was manning last year? Yeah, uh, great question, Pete. But before I answer it, I, I just gotta this. I gotta throw this observation out. I don't see any defensive. I'm looking at the back behind you, and I can see number 15, <laughs> 15, 15, 15. I don't see any defensive bodies. Pete, I'll work. I'm gonna that? work on that. Yeah, okay. I'll work on that. Sure. Um, now I forgot your question. Legarius to the outside yes, and yeah, what about with yeah. Um, well, I tell you what. Uh, I think back in Philadelphia. Uh, we had Bobby Taylor. Uh, what we did with Bobby is he played outside in the four DB packages and then he moved in in the five DB. So we may go that route. A little bit of it is, is going to depend upon the, I'm going to just say the next corner that surfaces, or is there a next corner that surfaces? Um, if we need to keep him on the outside, we'll do that. I think until then, we'll probably work them at both and then just see where it goes. We, we really need to find out what we have in the quote unquote other corners, if that makes sense. Yeah. And we'll go last, Seren Petro. Good, Seren. Uh, coach, uh, want to talk about Chris Jones playing defensive end and, and you know, maybe having that flexibility to move out there. Uh, how difficult uh, a transition is that? How do you how do you gauge? I know this is maybe not the best time, right? You're not getting a lot yeah. of work, but yeah. but when you do it, like making sure that you're not, you know, maybe losing his quickness that he has against bigger guys inside versus maybe uh, playing more power role outside. Like, how how do you balance that? That's a, that's a great observation, a great question. Uh, I have posed that to myself quite a bit because he is an imposing player inside. We all know that. Um, if we move him outside on a, on a number of the snaps and he's going to have to have, uh, he's going to be, have to be flexible to do both. Uh, we will miss that. Hopefully we will gain something on the edge when somebody changes a position. Obviously the first hurdle is the mental part of it. So Chris is working through that and he's been great. Uh, he, he's been here and been part of the whole thing. And I think that's important when you change a position, it's just not that easy to pick up a whole new spot. And we do some different things with the defensive end. So uh, he'll play out there a little bit. You know, we'll move him back inside when we have to. But I think it's a great point that you're making. I think your question is, how do you balance that? I'm not sure how you do that yet. Um, maybe it'll come down to, and I think we'll probably do a little bit of this, we'll come down to who we're playing and where maybe we can find a weakness and uh, maybe expose that weakness, you know, in, in the five offensive linemen. But all of that, we just got to get him used to playing the two spots right now and figure out the rest of it later on. Coach, we appreciate your time. Thanks okay. for joining us. Thanks, guys.